again slip into linguistics with Professor Sushant Kumar Mishraji, who will speak on the topic peripheral centricity in Indo-European linguistic continuum. A few words about uh, Dr. Mishra. Dr. Sushant Kumar Mishra is a professor at Jawaharlal Nehru Hindu University, now Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, and he currently serves at Nalanda University. Uh, he's on leave from JNU. He has been working in the field of Indo-European languages for the last about two decades. Uh, Dr. Mishra, if you can hear me, I request you to unmute yourself and commence your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mekalyan Sundaramji. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, for asking me to present here. I am grateful to share my ideas, some of the basic ideas, area in which I have been working uh, for quite a few years. So <clears throat> the topic is that peripheral centricity in Indo-European linguistic continuum. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Avdesh uh, Ji had uh, already talked about William Jones and his contributions at that point. Uh, I will go slightly um, in more detail on that, that uh, William Jones and some scholars earlier to him found the similarities between several languages of Indo-European family. As the name goes in the contemporary times, this Indo-European family, this is the name, but there were many names given to it. Indo-Germanish was another name, Indo-Germanic. There are many other names given to it initially. And in fact, uh, what we today study as uh, historical linguistics comes primarily from this field only. In a way, in terms of actual training, it is the same field. So scholars like uh, uh, James Parsons had found prior to William Jones, now there are scholars prior to William Jones, who have found similarities between several languages of Europe and some other places initially. That time they had not talked much about Sanskrit and Indian languages, but they had found similarities. This work was going on since 15th, 16th, 17th uh, century, 17th also, because their purpose was uh, to find the origin of the language. Of course, the biblical myth of Tower of Babel was the guiding light for them at that point of time. And very soon, within a century, they realized that it doesn't work. However, for long, they continued thinking about it. They found many uh, similarities uh, <clears throat> and they were, these similarities were more than just incidental similarities. So within Europe, for example, there appeared to be exact rules for these similarities like pho of Greek, old Greek, pho. Old Greek had pho, modern Greek has replaced it by pho. So pa to fa, a, a variation that we notice in many Indian languages also. Most of the Indian languages uh, did not have fa, but we are now evolving to that, that the labiodental sound of pa to fa. So pa or fa, as happens in modern Greek, appear to become systematically ba in Germanic languages. And English is a Germanic language. So in English also, there are many such examples of this. So with uh, William Jones, we find a new trend with inclusion of ex extensive details related to Sanskrit, because William Jones came to India. He started working on Sanskrit. And then he started comparing incidentally Latin and Greek, because he knew that language. In, at that time, uh, people studied uh, in Europe, most of the erudite people, they knew Latin and old Greek. So, he knew those languages and when he sat with the uh, pundits, with the scholars of India, and he started working on Sanskrit texts, mainly two texts, that uh, one is uh, very well known uh, because he was a judge, so he had to work on the laws. So Smriti texts, mainly Manu Smriti, but other Smriti texts as well should have been there, I presume, and translations of Kalidas, mainly Abhigyana Shakuntala. These two translations are well known by him. So he started comparing these structures. And as he has himself written somewhere that uh, he finds a very clear similarity between Latin, Greek and, uh, and uh, Sanskrit. So with this kind of uh, observation, there was a new discipline born out of the discipline of philology. So this new discipline was historical linguistics. So his scholars worked in this field prior to working in Sanskrit. 
They made, made comparisons between Celtic, that is Irish, Welsh, Greek, Italic, Italic means Latin, Italian, Spanish, French, then Germanic, German, Dutch, Swedish, Danish, Old English, and Modern English, then Slavic, many Polish, Russians, etc., etc. Parsons study, and he published a book that the remains of Yafet, it's a text of 1767. The remains of Yafet being historical inquiries into the affinity and origins of European languages. Now, it's an example of such a study. Now, you see here the remains of Yafet. Now, Yafet again goes back to the Bible. It's one of the three sons of Noah. So this story was there in entire uh, biblical or rather to say Abrahamic tradition, even Islamic tradition had this story. So how Europeans were there, so Yafet is, is the forefather of Europeans. So there are many such uh, stories taken directly from the uh, Abrahamic tradition overall. So needless to say that such a story taken up in the context of biblical stories found similarities between various languages, but could never establish any movement of language speaking groups on the basis of these similarities. They were there, but what was the land of diffusion? It was not easy to decide, very difficult to decide on this basis. The, a very good scholar, J.P. Mallory, he uh, summarizes this argument that Parsons therefore concluded that the first group, the language of Europe, Iran and India, this is what they could find. And for them, the first group was always the language of Europe. were all derived from a common ancestor. So common ancestry was presupposed and it concluded also. The language of Yafet and his offspring. So this common ancestral language should have been the language of Yafet and his offspring who had migrated out of Armenia. Now, as per the biblical story, when they started working on the archeology span of the biblical stories, and that was the period 17th, 18th century, they were working on it. The final resting place of the Ark is supposed to be in present day Armenia. And there is an Armenian apostolic church also related to that. So there are stories related to that. And perhaps there are some other evidence also in contemporary times, but uh, uh, not well attested in our contemporary archaeological debates. So then it should have been Armenia. So we should have come from Armenia. But from this point of view, the guess about the movement begins. There is only a guess. Nobody knows that whether we really migrated from Armenia. And later linguists have not accepted it also, not only linguists, but we archaeologists. Even the land of Yamnaya, as they say, is not Armenia. So, and that too, not on the basis of linguistic similarities. These conclusions were not on the basis of linguistic similarities, but on the basis of a biblical myth. Now, I you deliberately use the word biblical myth here, uh, related to the story of Noah's Ark, because we don't know whether it is true or not. So, several scholars prior to William Jones worked on similar theories and tried to find out what could be the origin of the place from where the apparently similar languages would have originated. Now, this is, again, a, a, a typical way of thinking that, that there should be only one, one unitary in everything. The diversity could not be accepted. So uh, th that centricity, the idea of the centricity that only everything should have originated only from one place. So this idea of unity, this idea of unitary origin is working continuously behind this kind of thought where we, you always find that where it was made where, and it must be only at one place. The simultaneous growth from various places is not even accounted for right from the beginning. There are many such scholars prior to uh, this period also like Gorpius Becanus was one and Gorpian thesis, hypothesis is also something very important in the context, but I will leave this aside. So Mallory presents some comparative studies of numerals between various languages. He, he does this, but these data and studies by Mallory and those would help us understand the kind of studies being undertaken at that point of time in the field of comparative philology, mainly among Indo-European languages, what is identified today as Indo-European languages. So, but with the arrival of William Jones on scene, we get a huge comparative data. Now the data has changed because the data started including Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin. There were some other um, scholars also uh, from France, basically. They were uh, paid to study some data from, a, from Persia. 
But uh, what happened that in Persia, they could not get the texts of the older Persia. That's why India becomes very important in the context that just prior to William Jones, there was a French scholar who came to India, <clears throat> Dupro. He came to India and why did he come? Because he wanted to find the old texts. They were getting the references, but texts of old Persians, mainly Avestan texts were not available to them in Iran. They spent uh, a lot of time searching it there, but they could not find it there. And then they found that it could be available in India. And it is prior to William Jones, just one decade prior to William Jones. They come to India and that Anketil Dupno in that process finds out Persian sources, old Persian and Western sources in India. And that is itself a, an interesting story in linguistics. And then they, he finds incidentally, he knew about the Persian text and Persian translation of the Rashiko and his school uh, of Upanishads. But he found the scholars actually knowing original texts and practicing in their day-to-day -day recitals, etc. Uh, they could study the text. So now he has a huge data before him, which he accessed through Persian, but he immediately realized that uh, there is a presence of all this uh, language data uh, here in India. So from that time, now we get to William Jones, who actually concretely presented this data. And one of his remarkable lines is there that earlier one also I recorded these lines while translating Abhigyan Shakuntalam. But this one I must quote because this is from February 2, 1786 lecture by William Jones. He says, the Sanskrit language, whatever may be its antiquity. Now it's a very important point. Whatever may be its antiquity is of wonderful structure more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either. Yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of verbs and the forms of grammar, than could have been produced by accident. So strong that no philologer could examine all the three without believing them to have sprung from some common source. Now, these two points, some common source and earlier the antiquity of Sanskrit, we should retain from here. Now, which perhaps no longer exists. So that common source does not exist anymore. Right from the beginning, he has already said this. This has set the tone of a lot of discussions which followed in this uh, field uh, by subsequent scholars for various fields, or various disciplines. So there is similar reason, though not quite so forcible, for supposing that both the Gothic and Celtic, though blended with a different idiom, had the same origin with the Sanskrit. Now Gothic and Celtic, now these two also, along with Roman and, uh, and Greek, they are supposed to have the same origin. And this is again a very important finding because uh, until then, uh, we find that Celtic and Romans, they were in clash. They, they are often not accepted to be the same. Similarly, even now those clashes are there, the Berber languages and the, uh, and the Etruscan languages. So, of course, on Berber languages, a lot of data is presently available, but the Etruscan languages, the data is not uh, fully available because the languages either have uh, died or are mixed with uh, modern languages or other classical forms of Latin, etc. but some data is available. So, here, uh, they, Gothic and Celtic, they are also supposed to have same origin with Sanskrit and the old Persian might be added to the family. Now, old Persian again, he says old Persian, but what he means, because today we use the word two types of Persians or three types, rather one is a modern Persian, but then even in the old Persian, we have one is old Persian and the other is the Avestan. So Avestan and old Persian, we make a distinction in our contemporary times. So now in this quote, as I have taken two, three points uh, highlighting them, here it is obvious that William Jones is talking about the old Greek in which great Homeric text would have been written. So Homeric Greek, there is a possibility of going slightly back to that also, but he's not talking about that. It is obvious. And here it is a, once again clear that the antiquity of any of the three languages in question what are the three languages, Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit? 
any the antiquity is not decided on the basis of the available data so he doesn't say anything about it also it is not even guessed by any scientific method what could have been the original language or what could have been the geographical location of this original language speaking community so this language data is until now there is no scientific evidence for that like uh, my previous uh, speaker professor chobeji was speaking about the genetic evidences maybe it is there but along with that the linguistic evidence cannot tell us that all the languages go back to africa what kind of a speech community it was and how it evolved there could be theories on origin of languages there are theories but necessarily they do not account for this aspect so there is one more point worth noting here that the sanskrit language has been considered as one unit in the entire history of existence in these theories so at least one unit this place is given nobody can say that is the older or there are other older forms of language so now we may presume that william jones would have closely studied the classical sanskrit language as he worked closely upon texts like abhigyan shakuntalam and manusmriti now this i state because sanskrit itself has a long tradition and it has a grand tradition and well, that tradition should not be less than uh, 3000 less than 3000 it, it should be more but at least it should not be less than 3000 because we find yask who cannot be placed uh, later than 9th century generally it should be 10th 9th 10th we can debate but it should not be cannot be less than 9th because panini is definitely pre buddha so buddha is 6th century it is a test text so 7th 8th century panini then uh, panini mentions yask he is one of the pre paninian grammarians so it goes back and then at the time of yask the vedic texts have undergone some changes so he is accounting for that so language is unit tree but it is evolving every language evolves every language that is spoken in speech form that evolves and paninian data suggest that it is a spoken the, the dialectal variations are also attested for by panini so along with that <coughs> william jones first and close interaction with abhigyan shakuntalam and manus smriti he is aware of the vedic texts also but that the continuity and evolution he may not have accounted for so now in the context of the antiquity of the sanskrit language as an issue raised by william jones in the citation above we have said whatever be the antiquity this is what william jones says the vedic language is certainly older and may even be oldest among the four languages in question that is greek latin old persian now i will give more arguments for this see the period why do i say this there are various arguments first the period of homeric text is generally ascribed to 8th 9th century bce i was talking about the dates 8th 9th century bce generally 8th to 10th century bce so now the period of old persian even if we go back to avesta texts is generally accepted to be between 1000 to 1500 bce now in this context if we examine the period of the vedic text it should be prior to a yask as i had said and yask is pre panini who is pre buddha buddha's period is 600 bc so 7th 8th and goes to 10th century now if yask has to be prior to panini and if vedic texts have to be prior to yask texts then it is evident that the vedic texts have already undergone some changes that make it necessary to create lexicons that would help us understand the vedic text. this is what yask does uh now there are two ways to look at it there are some scholars who say that uh, yask is working with his text nirukt on nighantu uh, and nighantu uh, some of uh, the nighantus are attributed to yask and some of them some scholars say that uh, it should have existed prior he only takes it and uses it so whatever be the be, be there but uh, the point is not to discuss that historicity of it the point is that the vedic texts are su sufficiently definitely much older from his time that is more than 10th century now that is one so this means that vedic texts if they have undergone sufficient changes and those changes are not only phonological or phonetic or phonemic but they are semantic changes also because of which the loss of meaning is possible so this happens at a time when not much influences on the oral traditions or preserving the texts are recorded so a lot of movement of people are not being recorded at that point of time at least until now the archaeological evidences are not there uh, and other historians are also not telling that various uh, waves of linguistic speakers from various groups they have come to uh, in indian subcontinent and mixed with the vedic people so in terms of interventions of large number of 
uh, cultural texts like Veda, Avesta, that might include the semantic and syntactic changes in the language. It should not have happened. That means the language has evolved by its own. So it is obvious that Vedic texts would be much older than the period of we are discussing, and that is the Avestan period. If it is 1500 BC maximum, Vedic texts should be older than 1500 BCE if we have to account for this kind of change. And then this kind of linguistic evidence can be further attested by the presence of Saraswati River in the Vedic text. It is again well known, a lot of scholars have written on it. So generally the historians ascribe at least 2500 BCE, at least, if not more, that's the minimum date I'm taking, to the Indus Saraswati civilization. Now, if you talk of this Indus Saraswati civilization as 2500 BCE, then that means the language itself goes back to the level of around 3000 BCE, because every civilization doesn't suddenly start using a language. And that is the minimum in that form of language. So now after this, the debate, I leave it to the historians regarding the historicity and area-wise expansion of the indus saraswati civilization, because that is itself being debated in our contemporary times. So it would suffice for me to state that the Vedic text in terms of being witness to the Saraswati civilization, go back, the texts, not the language, but the texts go back at least to 2500 BC, if not more. And there are no other parallel texts of that period, so far as I know. <clears throat> so, and it is text and prior to text, the language uh, would have evolved to get matured to account for, uh, for uh, such a high level of uh, text uh, that Vedas are. So now further, let us examine some of the linguistic aspects of Sanskrit as we find in those texts which are considered to be the first uh, examples of uh, Sanskrit texts. And this is again a continuum and an evolutionary trajectory. And I will give you some examples from there. So in this regard, first of all, there are other scholars who have worked so I will just share some of them uh, with them because I have already talked about historical linguistics. There is a methodological problem also in working here and scholars are working on it in historical linguistics. So this matter of archaism versus innovation, because see, language has innovation, it con continuously innovates. And then what are the archaic usages? So this difference has to be sorted out to the reference to speculative, and unverifiable PIE, Proto-Indo-European reconstructions, which are themselves based on the circularity. How do you account for scientifically that this was the Proto-Indo-European form? So that is itself something on the basis of the reconstructions that we are making out of the data which are available to us. And then on that basis, we've come back to Sanskrit or any other uh, later languages, and we try to understand the, uh, the historicity of it. That becomes a problematic uh, issue in terms of methodology, because there is a circularity. First, I go and make a conjecture, not even conclude, but make only a conjecture. And on that basis, I decided uh, at a later time that what is the uh, evolution uh, trajectory chronologically. So it becomes a problem. So if the Vedic sequence of sounds are expected to have later features, as some scholars have said, it is only conjectural because the original PI language itself is based on hypothetical conjectures. So the conjectures also is not necessarily conclusive here. So there cannot be any conclusive evidence for this. So besides, the reconstructions of the original PI can be itself part of the circularity as the language has the feature of sound changes, which are not always linear. There could be some principles like we say less effort, less effort in production, etc. But it is not necessarily linear. Because one basic fact that we say in linguistics is that the mouth cavity is itself not symmetrical. And when we make a vowel chart, we make it a bit asymmetric because our mouth cavity itself is not symmetrical. And so the vowel chart is itself not symmetrical. So the vocalic sounds, as they grow, they often grow in circular way. If we consider large periods of time, they change definitely, but they keep growing in a circular way. One sound which is there, it changes to the next sound. But again, the original sound might come back after uh, after certain uh, centuries, etc., whatever be the time period, depending upon the time period or geographical expansion. 
but there is a circularity because our mouth cavity is not necessarily a circular exactly rectangular so that is uh, a well attested fact so the similar features may be noted in tones intonations and other synthetic features of language uh, this we can see uh, i will give you some examples uh, but we can see in the evolution of chinese we, uh, in the evolution of several indian languages uh, till contemporary times even the uh, european languages and i will give you some examples from that for example synthetic languages grow to be analytical it has, it has happened in India. It has happened in Europe. It has happened, and sometimes analytical languages grow to be synthetic. That is also there. Latin itself, if you take historically, is an example of that. And, and uh, originally analytical, growing to be synthetic. And Chinese is a very good example, where the the synthetic forms have grown to be tonal. Chinese is a tonal language. It has five tones, and um, the the language language have. Uh, uh, semantic aspects due to those tones. There are many such tonal languages we find in Nepal also, and in our Northeast also, there are some tonal languages. Tone is available anyway in all languages in some of the other form. So <clears throat> what are the basic features? And they keep growing in circularity. So sometimes extra syntactic feature also come up in a language from nearby sources as part of the evolution of a language. Now, what could be the nearby sources in case of Sanskrit? not very clearly defined, except for that we say that there could be Dravidian, but Dravidian also itself is more synthetic than most of our Indo-Aryan languages, as Professor Avdeshji was talking about the family groups available in India. Dravidian is more synthetic in comparison to most of the Indo-Aryan languages. So in that way, it should be closer, even phonetically, phonologically, many of the uh, phonological features in contemporary Dravidian languages are closer to Sanskrit features in comparison to what we have in Hindi and such other uh, languages of North India. So, and, and from the European language itself, from where the core arguments are coming, you can see that a good example will be like the use of articles in Latin and Neo-Latin languages. It's, it's a syntactic feature. Latin does not have articles like a and the Latin does not have. But almost all Neo-Latin languages since medieval period itself exhibit a feature of the use of articles and sentences. And what is the nearby language from where they get it? Most probably Greek. So if you see medieval Latin, they will be using Greek articles and writing the Latin texts. So almost all of the Neo-Latin languages use the article showing concordance in the context of gender and number. Now this is an added feature. Even though it is there, but not necessarily uh, in Latin when they were using it. And in English, it is not there. A and the, it's not the Germanic group of language. German has it, the concordance of gender and number. So this aspect is important when we compare Sanskrit and Greek. That means the use of articles can come later. So the forms, they do not necessarily grow towards being simpler. Greek in its older form has articles. Old Greek has articles. Sanskrit does not have articles. So Sanskrit does not have articles. So in the context of Sanskrit and Greek, it would be difficult to conjecture whether it is a case of loss of a syntactic feature or gain of a syntactic feature. So similarly, the Avestan language, Greek and Sanskrit have three genders, all these three. All these three have case-based inflections, all of them, but we find a distinction in that also. Like Avestan language and Old Persian and Sanskrit have eight uh, vibhakti markers, we, the technical term Sanskrit is vibhakti markers, but in English we roughly say case markers, so case-based inflections. And now if we consider the genitive as a case in this case, because there is a lot of debate whether genitive, the sambandha karak, whether it's a karak or not, but here I consider it uh, as part of the vibhakti system. That's why vibhakti and karak are different. So vibhakti system, sambandha is taken. So old Persian, a later form of a western language, and we often talk, uh, William Jones also talked about old Persian, exhibit coalescing of ablative and instrumental case. They don't have ablative and instrumental. This kind of coalescing we find in other languages also. But this is not noticed in Sanskrit in both forms as both ablative and instrumental, Karan and Apadan, are detailed. Though in actual usages, sometimes both the cases can be used alternatively, and this is used. There are, uh, like for example, uh, uh, this we find in Greek also, but here from an example from Sanskrit, because we all can understand it better. So, vina and rite, these two take, it can take accusative case, it can take instrumental case, and it can take uh, ablative case. And it is attested even today, for example, contemporary Slavic language, Russian, saha and vina, 
Sahartha Tritiya and Vinartha Tritiya, Rite Tritiya will be there. We will take the instrumental case mainly. Now here we see the accusative case can also be used. If you compare the Greek, the Greek language does not have instrumental case as it is. So what we get is ablative instrumental. Now this is a coalition. So either we will use dative or ablative depending upon the context for wherever the instrumental cases are being used. So we can have Ramam Vina Gachat. Ramat Vina Gachat, Ramen Vina Gachat, all these forms are possible. So that means there is a variety in Sanskrit itself. That means it is spoken at a large area. That is possible. There could be alternative forms for saying the same. That is also possible. But again, the movement is not possible. And since various attested forms are there and coalescing is not there, coalescing of cases are not happening. So that means it is it must be retaining the older forms. So like in Old Greek, we notice only mainly four cases. Vocative sometimes is added, mainly four cases. Nominative, accusative, genitive, and dative. And in Latin, we notice five cases, ablative added. So with such varied usages, it is obvious that Sanskrit has a longer history as it accounts for variety of syntactic and related inflective features. So Kazanas has given several such examples from the verbal inflection between Vedas and Hittite languages. Hittite is considered to be one of the oldest branches of the language that are supposed to have evolved from the hypothetical PI language. Now here, some laryngeal theory also creates a problem. We'll take it later. So the similarity is shown by Kazanas in such verbal inflections between Vedic language and Hittite point towards the oldness of the Vedic language among the Indo-European languages. Here is a citation from another scholar, Joseph H. Greenberg, that validates our approach that we are taking, that we have already seen that multilateral comparison has been an integral part of the traditional comparative method as practiced by Indo-Europeanists. The work that is generally acknowledged to have initiated comparative Indo-European is that of Bob, which compared simultaneously Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, Persian, and Germanic. Now, this is a methodological comparative approach, but it does not put Vedic language in any way later than the oldest forms of the Indo-European languages, or earlier forms of syntactic uh, constructions I have given. We'll take more uh, examples for this graduate. So in all these scholars cited, that is Bob and Joseph Greenberg and so many other scholars whom I have cited earlier. So, the conjecture, so it cited, it is obvious that the conjecture of regarding the Proto-Indo-European and subsequent Indo-European family as a family group of languages is presumed on the basis of presumptive Proto-Indo-European unified language. And that's why we find a lot of variety within the languages. So if we presume PIE, and there is a scientific problem in that, I have already discussed it earlier, because it is itself a reconstruction and uh, not a definitive reconstruction. So this conjecture cannot itself be validated. Hence the presence of one single group going all over the places without any evidence, because other evidences do not corroborate this, can only be presumed on the basis of similarities of language forms. And if we consider certain forms to be older on the basis of hypothesis regarding origins of the language, the similarities between Hittite and Old Vedic languages as shown by Kazanas are extremely relevant in understanding that form of language, which could have been closer to the original PIE language. Now, as indicated until now, the conjecture that the PIE language was a unified language as a precursor of Indo-European languages is further open for analysis. This I have been talking all through the, my presentation. So Kazana also takes, it, takes up this issue. Kazanas, uh, in his text, Vedic and Indo-European studies, takes up this issue and analyzes it further. So let us see some, from the basis of Kazana, some isoglosses across the Indo-European languages. And I will add some more examples to that, what Kazanas has given now. For example, Udak is water in Sanskrit. It is found across entire Slavic branch of the Indo-European languages. Even the word vodka that we often use uh, as an alcoholic drink, this originates in the same isoglossic cognate. 
Now the Greek word for water is different. Sidra, the, now contemporary is Nero. Now Nero also goes back and there is a Sanskrit word Nira also. Whether they are related or not, it becomes an issue. There are many other Etruscan roots for this. And Nero, there is an Etruscan root also, but the Etruscan, we don't have the sufficient data. I told you earlier that there are Etruscan um, uh, interferences in the languages, uh, Etruscan borrowings, etc. So Nero, Nira can be from there. And then if it is a very old word in Sanskrit and other languages, then uh, even in Dravidian languages, sometimes this word Nira is being used. And it is supposed to be an Etruscan word in Greek. That's why the older form is Hydra, Hydro, Huder, Udor, which comes slightly close to uh, our Udak also. But Mira from Etruscan and from Arthravidian, there is a methodological problem here to find the exact cognate. But to say that it comes from here and there, and it has come, uh, some scholars have conjectured that is a Dravidian word. Now that becomes a problem because in contemporary Greek, we have the word Nira and it is supposed to have an Etruscan origin. Now, another example will be Duhita. Now, Duhita is Dokhtar in Old Persian and Dugatar in Greek. Now, look at this Duhita, Dokhtar, and Dugatar. Now, Duhita, it retains an E form. He. He, he sound. So he is a laryngeal sound. And along with the laryngeal, we have E. And it retains the original because normally with the laryngeal sounds, we expect that the, the ablaut, the Saussurian ablaut is uh, there. But E, A, uh, and A, uh, these three forms are changing. And E is the older form as expected to be as per the theory. So Duhita, Dokhtar, and Dugatar in Greek Dugatar is used, which we find in our English word daughter, where GH has become silent. If you take the older pronunciation, it should be something like doctor or from Dugatar, doctor, and then doctor, and then it becomes to our contemporary time uh, daughter, but generally it should be dogatar <coughs> from the Greek. So now this change of Sanskrit, her to go. Another aspect I'm talking, vocalic aspect I've already talked, I will try to talk about it more. But another aspect is change of duhita to duhtar to dugatar. Now from Greek to Sanskrit, we find ha and ga variation. That wherever ha is being used, ga is being used in uh, Greek. Now it is a common phenomenon and we find in Sanskrit and Greek many words like ego and aham. Now ego and aham. Here the sound a and u, again, the same, the duhita, du, he. Now he is between u and another a ending sound. So Sanskrit e and a and Greek a. So ha and ta. Now here ego and aham, similar example, we have duhita changing to ga. And the nearby vocalic sounds have undergone changes, which as per the theory should be later in terms of umlaut theory. So the system, but that itself can be questioned. That will, I will come a little later on that. So, but the systematic replacement of ha and ga first proves also that it is not possible to conjecture which is an older form. Now, both Lenitian and Fortitian are possible in this context and the older form cannot be clearly decided. However, if we consider other forms of the same word, that ha ga alternates, the situation is slightly different. For example, aham, I have said ego and aham. Now let us take the, uh, the, the declensions of aham and, uh, and uh, ego. Now ego immediately in nominative case becomes ego no noi emeis. Now this na formation is attested in Sanskrit also. It is attested in accusative, dative and genitive, like genitive plural, of aham is a smakam and also naha, the famous Gayatri mantra that we recite. Uh, naha prachodaya, the last two words, if you see naha, naha prachodaya, what is this naha? Na is a genitive formation, plural genitive formation. And in contemporary languages also, several Latin languages, later Latin languages, this na is being retained. But 
Sanskrit has a more elaborate form. So that means by no stretch of logic, it can be conjectured, conjectured that the form, form like avam, aham, avam, vayam, and no, no ego, no, no image. From no, avam cannot uh, evolve. But from avam, no, and no, these two forms can evolve. Similarly, the last word, aham, avam, vayam, vayam becomes a maze. So we find that, that there would be later evolutions in Greek. So no and no would be certainly later as sounds have been dropped in initial and final position, exhibiting the, the linguistic process of what we call apocopy and epenthesis in the process of evolution of language. Now, the same may be true for Vayam to Emmaus. Now, the date from, even the dative form, that Mahyam, Mahyam and the Greek dative form, Emoi. See, from Mahyam, we can attest to Emoi. But from Emoi to Mahyam, the journey is not normally possible. So, this would help us arrive at similar conclusions that Sanskrit forms are older. Other accusative, dative, genitive forms also can be compared and there could be other examples. Now, the vocalic sounds in Tuhita, this E, from, as per the laryngeal things, this sound should be older. So, the uh, another example here I add, that the Russian word, for example, I give you an example of um, Duhita, Dukhtar and Dugater. Now, take from one word from the Slavic, Dokh, Dokh, D-O-C-H, Dokh. The word is dosh. Now see, uh, duhita, dosh, closer, dukhtar. So for this daughter would help us understand this by apocopal dropping of ta. So duhita has dropped ta and her become sha. So dosh. Now it is more likely that the change of ga to sha, which does not consistently show a pattern, but ga to her shows a consistent pattern. So these forms, other forms should be later. Similar pattern can be seen in many other words, like we have a word like pant. Now the word is used pantos. The semantic changes are there. Well, the semantic changes you will find like pant, we know that pant is like path, whatever the, the root, in that sense we use this word. And this Greek cognate is pantos. Now pantos and pant, tha, tha and sa. How do we attest for this? Tha, tha we can attest. But adding of sa is not necessarily always attested because here panth is the uh, pratipadic form from where the declensions will come. Now with declensions, if you look at it, then panth will look at the, will appear to be prior. And of course, uh, it has several language uh, lexical usages till date. Similarly, if you see the word for C, and pontos is one word related to C also. That's why I use this word. And pontos uh, in many contemporary Latin languages means the bridge. <clears throat> and there are reasons for this. So that is a pathway. So that is a bridge. So, so this word for C and ocean also exhibits sufficient case that the word could not have been borrowed into Sanskrit. Even though now the problem is that Sanskrit scholars are supposed to be, uh, scholars, I mean, Sanskrit speakers are supposed to be at that point of time, at the Indo-European level, they're supposed to be landlocked people. Now that is not possible, though, of course, Lothal and others evidences are there. But the point here has been well explained in the, uh, this context. So I leave it uh, by just mentioning Shrikant Talgeri and his paper, the Proto-Indo-European word for sea and ocean. This is there. So mir is the word, mir, and uh, we find uh, lots of similarities uh, at that level, but certainly Sanskrit appears to be prior to that, to its uh, cognate forms uh, found in Latin, Greek, and other languages. Now, there could be several isoglosses like this with phonological forms that help us conclude that the words as found in Sanskrit should be older in form. Semantics is different aspect as its evolution follows a different process that we see in Yask also. Theoretically, Yask accounts for it. So Kazanas has also given some accounts of words and their forms that help us conclude the same as I have given with uh, my examples in the context uh, that we have discussed. One more example, let us take. 
because herpa alternates we have taken and a Hittite uh, laryngeal. It, it, this example will take us to Hittite laryngeal. Hittite laryngeal issues are always there. So, for example, uh, we have the, the cardia, the cardiac arrest, the cardiac specialist, cardiologist, all these words are being used. So, cardia and hridaya, they are cognate words. So, now the reconstructed pro, pro, in proto Indo European PI word is kridiya. If you say kridiya. But what is kridiya? If you say kridiya now, Daya is same almost, cardia, hridaya, daya, kriya, uh, except for the laryngeal ending, uh, it is almost the same because we also have hridaya. So ah, we say at the end, again, laryngeal. But what about the beginning kri, kri in uh, the Proto-Indo-European and krid, krid, krid in uh, Sanskrit and k, see, kardia, and which is a very simple sound, kardia in Greek. So Sanskrit sound is kri, kri. and this kri is again uh, ra as an initial vowel, and it's a full vowel. It, the vowel is ri, ri. So this vowel it takes the word closer to the vocalic formation of the Proto-Indo-European. Even if we take the uh, the uh, constructed Proto-Indo-European word, the Sanskrit forms often go closer to that. And this, uh, we notice that uh, it gets simplified in later wo uh, words uh, in Greek, etc. So here, uh, the sound kri is older because of the vowel. And if you accept this, then we go back to the problems in the laryngeal theory of sociology also. Now, if laryngeal sounds take us back to Proto-Indo-European levels, though reconstructed ones, the example of free with a laryngeal ejection should help us conclude that this is the older form of language as her loss has not happened in Sanskrit. So, however, often in this context, it is not accepted by scholars because see, khridi, khridiya, but from where have you got her? Because khridiya, khridiya is closer to khridiya. Ka as a very clear sound cannot be accepted at the Proto-Indo-European level if we accept the theories of the origin of language. So, however, often in this context, it is not accepted. And that's the argument here that it should be accepted. There are problems in the laryngeal theory. And the three different vowels are supposed to have developed from the same sonorant. This is what the laryngeal should tell us, that re, ra, and R and U, they have come from the same sonorant. Sonorant is another name for vowel. So now there is a problem in this. Now there is a paper written in French. Uh, many such materials are not, even Saussure's materials are, are available in French only, not yet fully available in English. So that also creates a problem of research in this area. <clears throat> so now here there is a problem. Uh, this problem has been addressed in the context of the, the Polish language. And it's, uh, <laughs> Polish language as a as an Indo-European language by Witold Manesat. He, in his paper, I have had some loss the theory the laryngeal that is uh, uh, kind of uh, unacceptability in the theories of uh, laryngeals. Some problems in the theories of la laryngeals. He conjectures again there is no sufficient logic for anything uh, here, but uh, with sufficient logic regarding the laryngeal theory, sufficient logic by that I mean that. Uh, it is sufficient to counter the other conjectures because earlier ones are also conjectures regarding the reconstruction of proto indo european So, uh, and this uh, Saussure so in his original article of 1879, where he only proposes a solution to, by PIE about. He himself says that he is proposing only a solution. It cannot be necessarily the solution for that. He's proposing one possible solution by talking of Proto-Indo-European ablaut, and it was not considered a final solution, even by Saussure himself. But to base all our arguments later on that uh, conjecture by Saussure, 
becomes problematic and I, by sufficient examples I have given this. Even Saussure's so words in self coefficient like the, the, the vowels, the three vowels and other vowel evolutions from the Proto-Indo-Europeans, what he calls sonantic evolutions, vocalic evolutions. It is only a proposition which works in certain cases, but not necessarily a fully determined conclusion because it doesn't work in several cases. And in his article, we told Manasat, he has shown it. He writes, the citation is in French, but he writes um, it in the context of uh, uh, several uh, Polish and other Indo-European languages that it is not an acceptable uh, proposition. So by these arguments, what I mean to say that often in linguistics, historically, it becomes very difficult to, be, to, to base our arguments on the basis of, uh, on the basis of the proto-Indo-European form of language and to conclude on that basis that Sanskrit has a later date. Now, that is a very, very questionable proposition just on the basis of conjectures, whereas the facts, as I have printed, presented some of them, they point to the contrary. And they are often, this contrary point of view that Sanskrit should be older, is often corroborated by some historical evidence also that I have presented here. So that is the base of the argument. Now I think uh, this is all I have to say. Uh, thank you. If there are any questions, others, uh, I'm ready to take. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishra, for a fairly detailed, very specific, uh, theoretical as well as historical uh, set of arguments and propositions that you made during your presentation. Uh, there are, there is one question which perhaps is a broader question. It's not specific to your particular uh, presentation from Ranjan Joshi ji. Say, shouldn't the Indus Saraswati civilization period be called a phase of Indian civilization rather than described as a separate standalone civilization? It could have been a question specific to yours or to the previous speaker, but if uh, that is Dr. Chabe, but if you want to take that, you could do that. Um, there is also another comment, but yeah, I don't see any open questions specific to your presentations as yet, but I trust you will stay with us uh, till in the rest of the symposium. And if there are any other questions, then we will take them towards the end. Once again, I thank you for a very detailed presentation for your argument and appreciate that.